There you are, Ben. It is. We've got a lot of snow. We were just talking about that. I think I, I put money on it that it's colder where Dean and the sheesh are, but, um, but probably not by too much. We have we have the ocean influencing our weather more than you probably been. So, <laughs> where in Maine are you, Anish? Um, I'm in uh, Portland, and uh, Dean's oh, slightly further up north in uh, Cumberland. Okay, because I have really good friends who live in Bridgeton. Oh, nice! Right near there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Southern Maine's a small, nice place. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in New Paltz, where I am. Um, We've got about five eighths of an inch of ice. Yeah, we have. We were talking about the same thing. So it, I just it, dug out my car before. It took me um, a well over an hour to just. <laughs> yeah, my driveway is a layer of ice with a layer of snow, and maybe even a layer of ice on top of that right now. So yeah, yeah it's great. We're yeah. Pretty much in the same place. <laughs> so maybe we'll get going. We've got uh, the recording going. Um, we have these meetings once a month. It's the I think it's the first Monday every month. Um, it's currently set up from 12 to 1. Today we've got a guest presentation from Ashish and Dean talking about their curriculum with uh, the University of Southern Maine. Um, it's been a, a extended collaboration involving some pretty unique partners, including the local Rotary and an NGO in the Dominican Republic. So. I guess without further ado, why don't we pass it to Ashish and Dean to start us off. And then maybe after that, we can ask some questions and go around and do an introduction and um, go from there. Do you want to start Ashish or? Um, sure. Uh, so I'm, sh should we just do the introductions first or do, we, do you want to do the presentations first, Ben? Do the presentation first. Um, we, you know, we can do the introductions actually right now. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll end up with you guys and you can go from there. So I'm, I'm Ben, I've been involved with Enable the last few years and setting up some community meetings. Uh, we currently have six community meetings every month. Um, it's, it's a new um, effort to see how we can encourage the community to um, be involved and offer some different options and have volunteer leaders. Um, and starting next month, uh, Karen and Lindsay are going to be uh, helping to lead the educational group this, this monthly meeting, which is awesome. So why don't I pass the mic over to Karen? Okay, so I'm Karen Bell, um, <clears throat> recently retired faculty from SUNY New Paltz um, in STEAM education. So, um, and so Lindsay Wells, who I think you, Dean, I, I think you worked with Lindsay already. Is that correct? I didn't hear you, Karen. I asked if you had worked with Lindsay. I thought perhaps. I had worked with Lindsay Lindsay's. before. Yes. Right. So we're going to be talking about the um, Helping Hands project next month when um, we lead the meeting, you know, something about that project so that she designed. Um, and our thinking is down the line that we can provide some kind of support in the way of curriculum um, to other groups who might be interested. And I know that uh, Enable You is interested in expanding out from just prosthetic hands. Is that correct, Ben? So yeah, Enable we were, has gone in a couple of directions with assistive right. technology and different kinds of prosthetics. And so we were looking at the possibility of more assistive technology in general um, and helping to possibly, you know, develop curriculum around that. We are working on another project that is connected to one of the 17 UN sustainability development goals and that there might be, you know, a way to incorporate that as well. So. Anyway, that's who I am and, uh, you know, I'm new to this group and, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure how much time I'm going to be able to give, but, you know, certainly Lindsay and I are working together. Great. So maybe we could pass it over to Dean. Okay, I am retired and have been working with Enable for five or six years now. 
uh, loosely working with Enable, <laughs> but I've called on Enable makers for help in the past. And when I started to get involved with the Rotary Club uh, here in Portland, Maine, they contacted me uh, via a contact from Enable and found out I was living in the area because they've been working down in the Dominican Republic for some time and, and trying to provide hands for people in need there. And there's a huge need there for both hands and legs. So we started doing that, as I say, five or six years ago and are still doing that to this day, although COVID has slowed us down dramatically. And the collaboration that has evolved here is one of kind of multi prongs, if you will. Uh, one is with the University of Southern Maine and you'll hear from Ashish Lamba in a few minutes. Uh, he's our primary contact there, but there are others. And we also work with an NGO down in the Dominican Republic that has come about to be precisely because of our involvement since we've been going down there. Uh, they have a volunteer group of people who are trying to provide the inter space, uh, a real clinic. It's called Prothesis Terapia y Prosatica, whatever, in Spanish. It's a therapy and fitting of assistive devices, primarily hands and legs. They have received uh, government recognition, land was donated and they're in the process of building a clinic, a fixed stone and mortar clinic. And they also have a, received an older school bus that they're going to fit out as a traveling clinic that will actually go to the people who need them rather than expecting the people to get to them at the fixed place because it's just a, very poverty stricken nation and people don't get around like that. So it's been very hopeful. Uh, we have fitted quite a few devices to date and we're starting to work on a new device, which I'll show you a little bit after all the introductions are done. And we get feedback now from the people that have been fitted so that we're better able to improve our product uh, as we go along. And it's our goal to be able to do fittings on site uh, the day that people show up for clinics. And that has been a little different. In the past, we would go down, measure people, take photos, go back to the States, make the device, get it back down there, and then fit people. And that's proved to be a little less effective than the way that we want to do it, which would be all at once. So with that, I will give it up to Ashish and uh, let you guys get to know him a little. Thanks, Dean. So I'm just going to put the slides up and I'll, I'll just get started. So I'm, uh, and you guys can see the screen, right? This is the presentation screen that you got. Awesome. So I'm Ashish Lamba. I am an assistant professor of mechanical engineering here at the University of Southern Maine. My background is in materials characterization, in mechanical testing, thermomechanical testing of materials, more from looking at alloys, but I find myself becoming a plastics engineer right now as well with this whole new world of 3D printing. Never wanted to become a plastics engineer, but that's that's the way that we have to go to in order to make a better world right now. So I'm also the director of the Composites Engineering Research Laboratory here that is housed at the University of Southern Maine, we, where we do quick service projects, research projects around polymers and composites for um, people out in industry. And we also help out startups as, as well. And I'm also the principal investigator of the lasers and uh, materials engineering group here at, at USM. That's lame, short. So that's what happens when you let uh, students name your, uh, your research group, but we went with it. Um, I'm a, I've been working with uh, the Portland Rotary, which I'm an official part of, uh, now as well since um, September of 2019, which is when I first met Dean from Enable and heard about the awesome work that they were doing with John Curran and Bill Dunn, who are associated with uh, uh, different Rotary clubs um, over here, and really trying to help out the whole process of 
designing, having better designs for the arms that are given out to the underserved in the Dominican um, Republic. So this is a little bit of what uh, Dean was talking about. So this is the in the Dominican Republic, the center that, that we help out. They are the Centro de Prostasis and, and Terapia and a Physica, uh, completely, I'm not a Spanish speaking person, but uh, completely butchered that. But uh, they serve both the uh, arms and, and, and legs. And as Dean was saying, there is, you know, these are the number of people that once you have a clinic who are waiting to be fitted with prosthetics, right? So there is a big, big need in the Dominican Republic for the underserved over here. There's, you know, there's deformities based on stuff that's happened during childhood, but there's also a lot of uh, machete violence that takes place in the Dominican Republic. Um, and these are just some of uh, the, the, the people that, that, that show up that need our help, right? So it's, from, from my point of view, you know, as soon as I heard about what was going on and the work that Dean and John and Bill were, were doing, I realized that the university has to have resources that we can, that we can um, help out at. And it so turned out that immediately in the next semester, uh, following semester that I that that I had met Dean and and John and Bill, I was teaching the entry level engineering design course in our curriculum, which is the junior design project, whereby students have to learn the engineering design process for the first time, and they also have to, at the end of the semester, come up with working prototypes for you know, having utilized the engineering design process. And I kind of wanted to summarize what the engineering design process is and what our curriculum is based around without actually going into the nitty gritty of, of things. And this is the video that I showed the, the class on the first day. And also the, I show this video to um, uh, high school students as well that we, that we do some outreach work with. So the engineering design process is essentially like a taco party. So let me I think I'm going to have to share my screen again because I forgot to share uh, audio, but share sound. All right. Hopefully this works. You guys can hear audio? The right. engineering design process is a lot like making tacos. Oh, no. Sorry. Let's start this again. There we go. The engineering design process is a lot like making tacos. Here's how. Let's say you've had a long day. Maybe you've gone to class. Maybe you just got off work. Maybe you just finished an intense workout session. It's now seven o'clock and you're hungry, but you've got friends coming over in half an hour. So what do you do? You go through the engineering design process. First, you define a problem or need. In this case, the problem is you're hungry and you've got people coming over in half an hour, and they might be hungry too. Next, you do some research to figure out the design requirements and your limitations. So in this case, you'd assess things like ingredients you have at hand, money you've got to spend, how much time you have before people start showing up, how many people you have to feed, and if any of those people have dietary restrictions. Once you've got a pretty solid list of criteria and constraints, you can start brainstorming ideas for solutions. Maybe you look online at nearby food options. Then, maybe you go to the fridge and you start figuring out what you can make. You weigh your options and you determine making something at home will be cheaper and faster than ordering something online. And you decide everyone likes PB&J, but you don't have gluten-free bread. Oh. But you do have corn tortillas. I guess I'll try PB&J on corn tortillas. And you make a prototype. You test out and take a bite. It's gross. But you want to make sure it's not just you, so you get others to test out, like your roommates or family. Everyone agrees. It's gross. You ask questions and determine what's gross about it. In this case, your testers like the tortillas, but not so much the PB&J. So you go back to the kitchen and reassess. This is what engineers call iterating, making changes based on test and user feedback. You realize... I've got ingredients for tacos? Dope! So you start making some veggie tacos. You try one and think... Hmm, this is kind of dry. You have other people try it to get their feedback. Most people agree. It's kind of dry. 
So you go back to your kitchen and start iterating again. You find that you've got the ingredients to make guacamole. You make the guac and you add it to the tacos. You test it out and you're like, this is tasting pretty good. But some of the other testers think it could use some spice. So you evaluate their feedback, you look in your kitchen, and you realize you don't have anything spicy. That's when you call your friend Sam who's coming over. And you're like, Hey Sam, can you bring over some hot sauce? I'm making tacos. And Sam's like, Sure. Also, I love tacos. It's now 7.30 and your friends start showing up. You tell your friends, I made tacos if you're hungry. You can add hot sauce if you want. And then you and your friends eat the tacos. They're like, these are pretty good. I'm going to Instagram that. You should share the recipe online. So you do. You've solved your hunger problem and engineered a taco party. Awesome. So it's always good getting students, you know, everyone can connect with tacos. Everyone loves tacos. So that's basically the different points of the engineering design process that we base our curriculum about but you know as with engineering curriculum you get into a lot of nitty-gritty of the stuff and it can get uh, it can get cumbersome so i didn't want to cover all of that in this presentation but just what the important aspects were and what i've done for this presentation is i've just pulled out a couple of slides from one of the design teams that did a decent job and I just want to tell everyone on here that that semester was the semester of, uh, it was the spring semester of 2020, which is when COVID first hit, right? So the first couple, the first half of the semester, everything was going good, very smooth. And then the second half of the semester, we had to switch to a completely online modality. So I had to change the deliverables for the course, whereby I only to I told the students that only give me designs, right? Because you can't come into the coming to campus anymore to actually prototype and do testing. But a couple of groups actually went up and, up and beyond the, the requirements and actually made their own prototypes with their own printers at home and things like that. And that's what uh, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so one important aspect that I do want to touch on when you're looking at the engineering design pro process is doing what's called a functional uh, decomposition whereby you break up the different aspects of whatever you're designing based on what the functions of your prototype are going to be. And that really helps guide the, and the design process and that iterative process that, that we spoke about. So this team over here, again, all of this was done on their own. You know, they started prototyping and testing. The, the ask here was that right now, the designs that were being used at that point in time, the prototypes that were being used in that point in time in the DR were all mechanical based. We wanted to see if we can do something with electrical actuation to actually do the grabbing motion um, in, in the prosthetics, but in that, in that cheap manner and made out of materials and parts that are not too expensive and heavy and things like that. And this, this, uh, uh, this team decided to work with these um, uh, servo motors like this, doing a whole bunch of uh, prototyping and testing, you know, just collecting different ideas that were available and combining them together, which is the smart thing to do, right? You, I always tell my students, don't start stuff from scratch. There is a wealth of information that's available um, out there. And for this, for that semester in that project, the students ended up making this design which at the end of the day for each arm was ended up costing just around $130. Um, but the issue with the design was that it was really heavy and it was not sort of realistic to have so many motors in the design as well. But these students did something cool. They used this thing called uh, Puck from MyAware, which actually senses uh, uh, muscle motion and then translates that into signals, which then can be used to actuate motion of the arm, right? So this was an idea which they actually made work, but this part over here is not very dependable. It depends from user to user a lot. So we didn't get that uh, dependability from it. So we decided to uh, abandon that process but then we were already at the end of the semester, right? So, and that's the other thing with working with undergraduate students. You start working with students, but then with, within within a couple of semesters, they've, they've, they've graduated and they're out of here, right? Um, so one of the students actually took the project on in the next iterations of the design to try to make it better and more uh, amenable 
um, to actually something that could be uh, deployed as his as his follow on project, which is our, our our final our senior design project, which the students do um, in their uh, final year slash final um, semester, and. He, he, he started breaking it down instead of using those motors, you know, the rotational motors, started thinking about using uh, uh, linear actuators, which are, which are much more suited for the process. Also did a whole lot of work figuring out what the best uh, uh, potential 3D printing materials are, did a lot of testing about material properties as well for that. And, you know, that's where my head goes, always goes towards, right? Because I'm a material scientist. But uh, I'll, I'll, I think I've made this available to Ben, but I'll make sure that you have these reports available because there's a lot of, there's a wealth of good information about the ma materials used for 3D printing, the conditions that are used for 3D printing, the properties that are used as well. And also he did a lot of work looking at the percentage infill and those kind of sort of things to see what the best uh, outcome uh, might be. And what he went with and what we supported at that time was to have this actuation, which was basically based on, you know, pulling your arm back and that would actuate your, 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 your hand. And, you know, sounded well and good at the time, but it actually ended up being a little more cumbersome and not realistic. The, more, the, the, the linear actuator that was used for this particular design was not strong enough, uh, uh, we found. And we also ended up going um, over budget. But again, all of this work, this, this was through COVID, right? So, you know, minimal amount of student activity on campus. And this student did all of this work on his own time in his house, uh, uh, really, um, Adam Robert. He did, some, he, did, he did some good work. And then he's like, all right, the end of the semester, you know, prototypes are ready. But what's the next thing that we need to do in order to improve the design, right? Should we try to use a stronger linear actuator? And then that's where you come into those pros and cons of things, right? You're already over budget. Now you want to use this new linear actuator that's probably going to be uh, more expensive as well. But we ended up finding the money for that. But by this time, the student has already graduated. And now I have no more students that are working on this project. And my plate is so full that I can't do all of this hands-on work myself. So, you know, Dean has sort of uh, used some of this work and also come up with ideas of his own with his own uh, arm design as well, which he'll, which, he'll, which we'll show. But we're really, you know, this linear actuator concept is the one that has ended up working out uh, uh, really well. Um, and, you know, we had an assembly party a couple of months ago. So, you know, what do I do in, in this team, right? I am the, I'm the hustler, right? So I just make sure that things, when things that are required to get done, they get done, right? So, you know, Dean does not have all of the resources he needs to do quote unquote, I don't want to say mass production of 3D printing because 3D printing is really not a mass production thing, but mass prototyping, let's say, right? Because we want to make multiple prototypes and ship these out for use in the DR, right? So I worked with Dean using all of his printers and then we have a whole bunch of 3D printers that are all fused deposition modeling, SLA based, um, over here at the university as well. So, you know, we, we did a lot of printing there and then with our powers combined, we got together, had these, uh, did this assembly. And I think we assembled four or five arms with this uh, linear actuator design. So Dean, I'm gonna stop sharing for this minute if you wanna show the arm right now. Sure. Uh, first off, I'm gonna show just one of the prototypes of the hand. Uh, I went with this one for quite a while, and this is what we have actually testing down in the Dominican right now. It's a push-pull design. And so it's very simple. It's just one, one pull does the whole thing. There's no individual fingers. And so that way we can use one linear actuator, and that saves on both expense and weight, as well as complexity. We don't need a computer. Uh, you don't need Raspberry Pi or anything. And this is an example of the arm. Uh, you can see that it has a talon grasp. The pinch movement is not a bad one. You can do a lot with a pinch, but I find that with this type of design, a pinch is hard to make uh, and it stops everything else once you've made your pinch. So you can't go close farther. So, uh, this is the open position, and there we're going closed with that talon, which is two fingers on side of the thumb. And you can grasp a lot with a talon. It's one of the more efficient grasping 
mechanisms. And let's see, uh, the hand is interchangeable with other devices. It has a standard half inch bolt connection between the hand and the wrist. And this push rod is easily removed. You just clip off that little nylon filament that holds everything together. And then you can unscrew the hand and put on something if you had a specific adaptive device, such as for swimming, a paddle, or to hold onto handlebars, or if you had a specific need, you could design a specific device to just screw on. Uh, we're using a casting process to join the hand to a, a gauntlet and then to a person's arm. What we do is we cast an arm, uh, we cast the residual limb of the patient, and then we go and take that off. And so that's a very firm, exact comfort fitting piece. And then we go and attach a second cast to the gauntlet and that casts to the patient's arm. Uh, cast. So you've got a very lightweight, strong, durable uh, device, and it's been working great. It's very comfort fitting. Uh, once you get there, what, what I have in this box right here is the linear actuator, which fits back here. And then there's a battery inside there, which is a rechargeable nine volt. And there is uh, garage door opener, basically transmitter system for open and close. So one button will open the hand, if I can push the button, and one button closes the hand. So this won't work really well for dual amputees, but it works great for uh, people who have just one forearm loss. We can adapt it easily to uh, uh, below the shoulder amputation, uh, we have a lot of needed below the elbow down there because the machete violence or quite often people trying to hook up to electrical uh, will cross their wires and have a little explosion that results in the loss of limb. Uh, the fellow you saw with missing two arms in Ashish's earlier presentation, his name is Hector and he's, uh, he's homeless. So he has a whole lot of issues going on and no money and no resources. And we managed to fit him with two arms, but he lost both of those arms in an electrical explosion. And we haven't heard from him since. So I don't know <laughs> what's going on, but anyway, so that's where we're at. Uh, this particular model right here, I'm using, and I've tried it with five, which is the one I showed you, tendons. I've tried it with one tendon, which does work, but it doesn't work as well as three tendons. So this is the Goldilocks solution. And it seems to fit the way it needs to fit and do what it needs to do. The other design aspect that I'd like to point out on this particular hand uh, and something we've been using for a while is it has a flexible palm. Uh, I've made this out of flex TPU and it will fit uh, a pen and hold it, excuse me, a pen and hold it tight enough uh, that a person can write without needing to actuate the hand at all. And so that's, a nice feature because it's not just a pen. You could put a paintbrush, you could put a silverware. There are different things that that flexible palm can hold. There's a notch in the design of the palm. So everything accommodates very well. The final thing is that rechargeable nine volt battery. These are fairly recent innovation. And what's nice about them is that they will recharge on a phone charger. So if you have a standard USB-C connection, uh, you can charge your, your hand every night if you need to, but it may last more than one day. Uh, it's pretty, pretty robust that way. This is not a waterproof situation, of course, 
for either the linear actuator or the battery, but in general, it's, it's very handy. Uh, you can go through a, a light rain kind of thing. It's not that, that problematic. The neat thing about these batteries is they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, the linear actuator, I found a less expensive one than I was originally using. Uh, they run about 25, less than $30 anyway. Uh, the batteries, you get two batteries for less than $20 with recharging cords. Um, you can get the um, transmitters for less than $15 uh, on Amazon. And so the whole cost of this entire setup with $20 of casting tape 25 or 30, say 30 for the linear actuators, 55, 15 for the transmitter, 70, and what's the other? <laughs> In any event, the whole thing comes down to just under 100 bucks, which was our design parameter in the first place. And uh, it's amazing what you can hold with this. It's not ultra strong. You're not going to be. Uh, wielding a machete with it to do sugarcane work, but you can do brooms, steering wheels. Um, you can hold tight enough to most things in a, this push-pull design that it's very effective. You can pick up a piece of paper if you so desire. I mean, the talon grip may bend the paper, but it holds it just fine. You can ha handle currency, uh, <laughs> credit cards. It's a pretty amazing, uh, amazingly versatile little design. And I think that covers all the major points. Oh, the strap, of course, that's $4, $3, $4. But anyway, there you go. Ashish. Yep. That's awesome. Thanks, Dean. Um, so Dean's the real engineering wizard here. Dean, you're awesome. Um, then, so now we've also been moving into uh, looking at uh, lower limb. Uh, oh, wait, I'm not sharing my screen, right? So one second. So, so we've also been looking into uh, uh, lower limb prosthetic designs as well. So Dean has a couple of uh, designs that he wanted to test. And this is the favorite part of the project, right? When, when, when someone comes to me and they're like, "Hey, how do we figure out how strong something is?" Because you know that's where my expertise lies. So this is what's called a uniaxial uh, tensile, uh, a uniaxial load frame, which basically pulls material apart or pushes material together in one in one axis. It's used to test the the what's called the tension and compression uh, 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 material properties of, of of a bunch of different uh, uh, materials. So we actually wanted to test the, the material that uh, uh, Dean had used to 3D print these components that you see for this uh, lower limb prosthesis on here. And I was, you know, this is the fun part, right? So I had to take all of these things apart, you know, figure out how we can do some kind of testing that's similar to what uh, uh, testing out and, you know, someone actually walking with these things would, would, be, would, would be equal to. And we got some really surprising results. So for all this material that we were using, TPU, Flex TPU, it ended up being super, super uh, uh, conforming and it was able to overperform uh, than what we expected it to do. So what's happening right now with this is that the current batch of students that are in the capstone, the, 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 the first capstone project this semester, they've been charged with producing uh, lower limb uh, prosthetics. Uh, as well with some form of electromechanical actuation. So that's the work that we have ongoing at the university um, right now. So this pretty much brings me to the end of the presentation. You know, these are my contacts. That's my, my research website is alambalame.com. And I'm on Twitter as with Dr. Lamba and on, on LinkedIn as well. So, uh, you know, always happy to connect and and if you guys have any questions or you want to use our, our, the, our 3D printing facilities for doing testing or prototyping, please let me know. Great. Thanks so much, Ashish and Dean, for, for sharing your work. Um, I, I had a, a couple quick questions before I open it up to everybody else to steer things back towards education specifically. Um, there's a, a pretty common problem I notice that universities and schools will 
create curriculum incorporating enable work, but they won't, uh, they'll struggle to connect the dots with device users. And they'll ask you know, how they can bridge that gap, how these devices can be used, where can they send them? I think um, there's something really notable about what you guys have developed in that um, there's, there's really four pieces to this puzzle. It started out with a rotary um, who had a mission um, and coordinated a team. They reached out to an enable volunteer, Dean. Um, Dean's been working on, you know, as the, as you said, the engineering wizard, he's been doing iterations. He's been reaching out to the open source community. He's been really digging into low tech solutions, which is really notable because of, if you want to use this stuff on a wider scope, you really have to think um, in terms of the price tag. The national NGO being the, the third component is something that has allowed you guys to develop a relationship with device users to continue the, the community development, the local resources and partnerships with medical facilities. That's all happening independent of the, the testing that you guys are doing and the development. It, it's sort of in concert. And then the university being able to do the testing, the mass prototyping, um, take care of some of the documentation with student projects, and then the high tech um, testing. It's, it's a really wonderful recipe. So I, I wanted to ask you guys to maybe talk a little bit about how that's been going and um, any recommendations you have for other schools to, to follow that model. Yeah, I can get started on that. Um, and then Dean, if you, have, if, you, if, you, if you have stuff to follow up on, uh, uh, please feel free to add. Um, that's, you, you really hit the nail on the head there, Ben, with summarizing all of the different components that we have, right? And from an education perspective, right, the curriculum that I try to teach students from engineering design and try to get them to think about from their uh, uh, first year and sophomore uh, process is to start thinking about engineering design, start thinking about simulations that they could be doing as well prior to prototyping and testing, and then actually doing, you know, 3D printing has really brought forth this whole aspect of rapid prototyping, which was not available, you know, a little more than uh, 15, uh, well, wasn't widely available 10 to 15 um, um, years ago. Um, and, you know, that aspect of design, simulation, testing, iteration, prototyping, testing, it really forms a nice uh, loop, which is very, very uh, available from an educational standpoint, particularly from an educational standpoint that is known to be effective, right? Project-based learning. And it's, it's especially with projects like these, it's, they're, it's very easy to motivate the students as well. They're clearly doing good for society, right? Which is what, one of the big reasons that people want to um, become engineers. The one aspect of that that is challenging and that we are still trying to solve is a quicker turnaround of testing in field, right? So finding people in the US that will are are you know that that don't have limbs and are are willing to do the testing of our designs so that we could get a quicker turnaround on doing design improvements because right now the way that it stands is we just decide based on student work or all the design changes that dean has made and his you know his recommendations what the current best design is going to be and then we send them out to uh, uh to get used and tested right and it's really test that testing which is being performed pretty much by the end user at this point, which is not a very effective way of uh, of doing this. You know, for example, we we send these designs out, we send these prototypes out to the DR. The first uh, uh, electromechanical arms that were sent out to the Dominican Republic was in November, right? November is when we we had the pizza party, Dean, and you know it's been difficult getting feedback from them, right? Because just with COVID doesn't make things easy, and then it's also you know people don't come back to the center to, 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 to the center to give feedback and do things like that right so i think the one big piece of the puzzle that we have to figure out is that whole networking component and getting people to actually use the the and the prototypes that we have over here for quicker uh, feedback to, to for design improvements dean do you have anything to add to that Yeah, actually, um, as Ashish noted, it's very hard to follow up with some of the devices that we have fitted with people. And as those of you who have fitted others know, there's probably a pretty high rate of 
non-use once it's fitted. Uh, it's they're great for kids. Kids love that Phoenix hand, and that has been a just an incredibly successful part of the Enable system. Uh, where I'm dealing with adults all the time, pretty much we have very few children. There's not a lot in terms of birth defects uh, or injury for kids, fortunately, uh, in the DR. But it's adults who seem to get into trouble with losing their limbs for one reason or another. And they are an itinerant group at some level. Um, they may have a phone one month and not be able to afford it the next. And they may not be available when you call that former number. So even though everyone has a phone, it doesn't always stay the same. And the other people in uh, Prothesis uh, Central is they're all volunteers and which is great. They have a, at least a dozen committed people who are working at this. There's just not always a lot of success in finding the feedback that we're seeking. However, that said, we are getting some. And yep. through that, we have been able to uh, embrace the cultural realities that uh, a Phoenix hand with an open forearm that's held on with straps was not a design they, they liked. And they did not want that. They want something that looked a little more natural. So we've kind of hedged that a little bit. We've had many different design iterations uh, so that we have a more anthropomorphic looking hand and forearm. And the color, we've just decided to plainly go with black. Now that's not a popular color there, but it's readily available. Uh, we don't have to mess too much with tones of skins and it's easy to replace parts then if you need to have a component replaced on the, on the whole thing. You don't have to worry about matching that aspect. So we have a much more natural looking hand than we had in the beginning. And it still will never look like a real hand. It will never function like a real hand. But it's not a bad compromise at this point. Yeah, we're feeling pretty good about how the design has gone and the cost as well as getting people to continue to use it after they've received it. So the other aspect that's so important is the facility, the clinic, which fits them on that one day they go in, there's a training component. So you get to learn how to use that and experiment with it and learn different ways that it might be available to help your everyday life. Uh, they will teach you techniques like the simple piece of putting a, a circle of twine or wire or whatever on a zipper. And you can then function the zipper with that and your new hands. And that's something that with one hand, a zipper can be hard to do. <laughs> but with having a, this loop, a simple thing, it works great. You may need to wrap a toothbrush with a little bit of uh, tape or silicone, whatever. You want to find ways to make this hand work. And I think we're going to have a much higher rate of use and continued use with the devices that we're making now than we had with the ones that we delivered when we first started. So that's what I would add. <laughs> Great. So maybe we can open up questions to everybody else. And, and again, if you haven't introduced yourself already, um, maybe before your question, just introduce yourself. I've got some questions. Uh, I'm John Schull, co-founder of Enable. Um, great presentation, Ashish. Nice to meet you, Dean. Always a pleasure. Congratulations. This is really um, great progress. Um, I'm impressed by several things. I just want to want to go over them. Um, it's a nice modular design, and indeed, you have significant innovations for each module. Your casting technique strikes me as just, frankly, a breakthrough. Um, and I'm wondering if you've gotten feedback from uh, prosthetists about it. What? 
Dean, you just mu muted yourself, Dean. Was I muted? Sorry. <laughs> uh, it was actually initially a collaboration with the Hanger Clinic. Uh, we had a <laughs> prosthetician there who was interested in our project and wanted to continue working on it with us. And he suggested the CAST system. And we ran with that. And uh, that's how it developed, basically. Uh, when you're doing the actual casting, you have a uh, you put several socks, uh, prosthetic socks on the arm. You do the casting. Uh, when you take that off, you lose one of those socks will come off with the cast that you've made. And then you can just rip that out there. Yep. And you've got a nice form fitting. There you go. Thanks, Yep. Um, you've got a nice form fitting system uh, for the, the uh, recipients. Forearm. And that's what it, it and will they, look they, like. They can pull their arm out of that, of course. It's not like a permanent cast. What's that, John? They can withdraw their arm from the cast once it's yes. done. That's right. Yep. So. And then we take that cast that we've made of their arm <laughs> and we attach it to a gauntlet, which is, looks kind of like that. It has four prongs and... Uh, a nut and bolt inside a uh, uh, printed gauntlet piece. That piece will match to the to the hand. Uh, you can see in Ashish's picture here, the cast comes down uh, from his forearm where the big strap is, and then it goes down to the wrist. And that's the second cast embracing the first cast, and they become a solid unit. And then we attach that more firmly because it won't stay on by its own with uh, the addition of uh, just a common elbow brace. Uh, it's nothing heavy huh. duty or out of control, but it, they're not expensive. They're less than less than fifteen dollars, basically. So and the elbow you, brace. Yes, I'm John. Sorry, the, the point of the elbow brace is to snug it up so it can't slip off. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it will also help if you have an elbow actuated device when we were still doing those, it will help stabilize that whole elbow pivoting uh, hinge mechanism. So it was twofold in that device that you're looking at there. So that whole process of saying, okay, let's take a look at your bare arm and then attaching uh, the, putting the cast on the arm and then putting the bridge cast and the hand on, how long does that take? It's not that long, actually. Uh, if we do it here in Maine, where we're, it's very, uh, we're quite dehumidified here, uh, yeah. the cast will set up in 10 minutes. You're, wow. you're done with their cast and you do a second one, another 10 minutes. It's very quick and rigid at, at that point. Uh, down in the Dominican, we found humidity was an issue. And uh, sometimes there was a one day they were casting when the cast would take almost an hour to set up because of the humidity still, and the it, heat. It's, that's it. It's still huge compared to the time that it would take for 3D printing and compared to what I assume is a superior custom fit to yeah. what you would achieve with 3D printing and mold making and so on. So in principle, someone can walk in, uh, you have an off-the-shelf hand, yeah. and they walk out. So that's just huge. That's, that's huge. exactly, that's, okay. that's, how it, that's how it happens right now. Yeah. Okay. So that's it's really huge. And that's actually, of, I think, something that is of interest and relevant beyond your other two modules, to which I will now advert, if I may. So then you've got the motorized uh, unit. It looks yes. like a self-contained module. It contains a, a rechargeable battery and a linear actuator. And all of that... And there's no, oh, and a garage door opening mechanism. Uh, 
all of that costs seventy dollars or so, roughly. So it's under under a hundred dollars, and it is. How is that attached to the first the first module? How is that attached to the to the plaster armature, if you will? Uh, the gauntlet has a nut inside of it. So the gauntlets can be pre-made. And then you, when you do the second cast that incorporates the, the patient's fit and the gauntlet, all of that becomes one solid unit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it becomes this. Basically. So if it all becomes one solid unit, what's the function of that strap on top? That holds uh, the linear actuator on. Sometimes there needs to be an adjustment to make it work more effectively in the right range. Hmm. So that, um, that, that module containing the battery and the linear actuator is not attached onto the, the, the cast that you see over there. So it just, the strap just holds it in place oh, there. Got it. And I okay. use Velcro underneath that so it doesn't slide much and when you strap it down hard then it's a nice firm fit it doesn't move around okay so uh, that's a wonderful thing and by the way it looks like it wouldn't be that hard to make that a waterproof unit to put some kind of a uh, a balloon around it for example uh in yeah order and there's there's other there's other solutions for waterproofing as well right so we could have waterproof uh, uh, uh akin to urethane sprays that we can just that, that that just spray on and cure and and make things waterproof as well so yeah so the okay. cast is waterproof and you can get that as wet as you want it won't matter uh it can be taken off cleaned out washed rinsed, whatever you want in that. And the prosthetic sock that a patient would wear uh, equally can be just thrown in a washing machine or wash, hand washed. It's, it's not a big deal. And others, they're inexpensive, so they can go to central prothesis and get more uh, if they need them as they wear. Waterproofing would only entail waterproofing this device and the linear actuator. So yes, it could be probably could be pretty easily done. I'm not real keen on that because uh, if it did leak, you lose the devices. However, <laughs> <laughs> it could be done. And the hand parts, they're all totally waterproof. You can't damage yeah. these. Uh, I found we're finding that PET G is pretty good material as expense wise and printing wise. Uh, and heat and humidity wise, PETG works fine. Uh, this is an ugly prototype because I got tired of doing browns and blacks. And so I'm using up end rolls of other, other colors and things um, as I'm making these. However, uh, the flexible TPU material, which people are afraid of printing with, but I have no trouble, it prints great. I do have direct extruders, no Bowden tubes. But TPU, uh, this is Flex 98 from Kodak. It is, it prints beautifully. It's super strong as a sheet that can attest to. Uh, we did one leg thing that we bent it completely to 90 degrees and it did not break, it just bent. And when he released the pressure from the machine, it slowly resumed its natural shape, its printed shape. So uh, if you're talking about a two to 300 pound person, it's more than effective uh, in dealing with that amount of weight. It was like a 600 or 700 pound person that I tested and it was still fine. So yeah, it was just <laughs> an amazing, the, the I the never on itself. Uh, the pylon itself was was totally fine, but no, we were actually testing the foot and the uh -huh. part that attaches on to the, the stump itself, right? So that's the 3D printed uh, material. And it was just, I want to do more research, like too many things, like too many butterflies to chase, but this material is just amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. It was super. Ben, you were raising your hand. Yep, we're, uh, we are running to the, the top of the hour. I wanted to, to thank Ashish and Dean for for presenting today. Um, I thought I'd share really briefly that this is um, one of six different 
community events this month. Um, so we are already on to the Enable Education meeting, but if we zoom forward to the end of the month, we do have a, a focus follow-up workshop on February 25th. That's gonna be looking at lower limb devices. Um, Eric from Paraguay and Ahmad from Syria are gonna be joined by Dean and Ashish to talk about their work with lower limb devices. Um, so if anybody's interested in, in focusing more on that, feel, feel free to, to circle back around. Any other um, questions that we have? I do have a meeting at one, so I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna be taking off in a minute. And I'm not sure if that's gonna end the, the meeting for everybody, but um, I can be a couple minutes late. Karen, do you have anything to add? I just wanna say that this was really amazing and, um... You know, I don't, I don't have really access to a 3D printer anymore. I don't have one. Um, but, you know, I have been working a little bit with our engineering department and our material science people at New Paltz. Um, and we were looking at other materials, actually, because we were looking at water filtration and using local plant material as a filtration type of, uh, you know, creating locally. But my big question is, um, what about helping these people to make some of the components themselves? So the, you know, if they have off the shelf hands and you have the component pieces, it seems like it's the forearm piece that really has to be customized. And what about, you know, training or sharing how they can make that component and put it together for themselves, I think you get a lot more feedback from the recipients if they are invested in it. That was the, the thing that I was always looking for. No, um, absolutely. So we have uh, at the center in the, the, the Dominican Republic, there is a 3D printer, maybe even two 3D printers. I'm not sure, Dean, if they have them there, but it's just a, it's also a problem of skills and education right so yeah we we have it there and the idea of it being there was to serve as something that could serve to make parts and print parts that could be used for um you know the modular design for like repairing and maintenance of the arms that are already out in service over there right but i don't yeah i don't know dean do you have any feedback on the use of that 3d printer in the center no that's our ultimate goal is to get them producing for themselves that's right. the overall mission uh However, there's a strong or large gap between the educational ability as well as the, uh, the component ability of having 3D printers, learning how to use them. It's a pretty steep learning curve for a lot of people. And they just, they have uh, such a basic level of uh, technical uh, availability right now. Right, uh, right. It's, well, then you have to go with younger people. Yeah, yeah. no, that's it's absolutely right. And it, school, you know, three D printing itself is, you know, such a thanks, Ben. We're, we're, yeah, I think we should be, we should be good. But three D printing itself, as a skill to become good at, requires a lot of patience and a lot of time as well, right? Because it's not oh, a mass yeah, production <laughs> process. Um, so. Yeah, you know, Dean has become this amazing 3D printing guru, but it, it took him a while to, to get there, right? And it's the same feedback I get from my students who are working on this project as, as well, right? It's things go very wrong with 3D printing and then, you know, trying to figure out what parameters need to be adjusted in order to get the right properties that you need. There's no, a I lot totally get of that. that. I mean, I've done a, a lot with 3D printing myself. I don't have it right now, but, you know, I had brought 3D printing to the School of Education at New Paltz. Um, nice. yeah. you know, so, um, yeah, and I haven't worked with any of the materials that you have. What I was suggesting initially is that <clears throat> the, you know, making this, the, the armature, not, you know, just the piece that it connects to the arm, you know, the mm -hmm. limb, um, casting that doesn't seem like that is such a huge skill. No, and in fact, our group down there is the doing their own start, casting. You know, and then, you know, once people get motivated, all of a sudden they start to figure out how to learn things that they need and want. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
that seems to me, I mean, it sounds like you're, you know, you're obviously right on, on track with that. And it's really fascinating um, what you've all done. I'm sorry, Lindsay couldn't join us, um, but it is, um, you know, being, uh, it was recorded so she can watch it. Um, but the other thing too, is that she is working with some of the people from our engineering department and our secondary math people with the robotics club at the high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, to get younger people involved, I think would be the way to go because they're probably gonna see it as, you know, a real need and they, they can give back to their community. So, and you know, there's a lot of these um, groups from colleges that would go to a place like this on the winter break or over the summer for a month and actually, you know, could be learning themselves and also teaching. Because as you said, Dean, you know, a lot of them, they don't even use it. You know, they go through this mm -hmm. whole process and you make it for them and then they don't use it. So that's, that's, that's a big disconnect, you know? Yep, so you want, definitely obviously is. You want it to be useful for them so they are gonna use it, that's the whole point. Yep. Well, uh, it's tough for us to imagine how resource limited they are down there. That's uh, the, I the, mean, the point, it yeah. is. It's really yeah. lowest level of poverty going, and it's it's very tough just to to get by. Yeah. And uh, education wise, they have extremely limited possibilities, and medically, you, they have very limited things. If you're anywhere outside of one of the major urban areas like Santiago or Puerto de Plata. Um, they have tourist areas, but they don't have hospitals anywhere. They don't have doctors anywhere. So if you get damaged out in the fields or get hit by a car in the countryside, the thing that to do is to uh, amputate. <laughs> That's all they can do. They can't repair uh, 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 accidents the way that, <clears throat> excuse me, accidents the way that we can here. And it's the same thing in the education system. The fact if uh, one of the other or two of the other aspects of the rotary mission that they've been doing all these years is hearing aids. Uh, some classes, although there's another group that handles those and water filtration. And they do water filtration in schools and villages because they don't have clean water otherwise or as much as they need. Yeah, well, that's that the project that, we were working on um, through yeah. the NSF grant that we just submitted back in October was on water filtration. Um, and that's the level of uh, resources that is our most helpful right at the moment. Uh, down the road, hopefully, they'll be much improved uh, through time. But we're working on that. That is our ultimate goal you know, to have more people involved and have them producing their own, that would be fabulous. <laughs> right. uh, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need to go to... Uh, okay, uh, so do I, but thank you very much. I really... Uh, Thanks, it was good meeting you and good speaking to you as well. Yeah. All yeah, right, Karen, good. say hi to Lindsay for me. I will, I will. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.